And I rise today to speak to this motion uh, about the impact of transmission lines. And it's a motion that we've come to know as Transmission Tuesday. But I think today, it being a Monday, I'm going to rename this motion to Mathematics Monday. Because for too long, we've been told that we have to follow the science, uh, but there's never any attention paid to the actual mathematics that underpins the science. And if you look at all the great scientists, they're actually famous not for their theories, but for their mathematical algorithms uh, or their constants that they came up with, up with, whether it be Einstein and his E equals MC squared, uh, Planck and his E equals HV, Avogadro's number, Planck's constant, uh, Wien's law, all of these guys came up with a number. And uh, so I'm going to look at the numbers today behind the claim. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, yes, it's true that uh, renewables uh, and transmission lines will have a devastating impact on the environment and they will have a devastating impact on the cost of energy. So let's just acknowledge that. Uh, and you know, I, I, you know, people love to conflate the issue between the science and the environment. And one of our values, one of our party's values, is the need to protect the environment. So can we just tick all that off? Love the environment, protect the environment. But I want to focus on the mathematics. Now, the alarmists, the climate change alarmists, and yet again, do I believe in climate change? Absolutely, because the ch climate changes every day. That's called the weather. So can we take that out of the equation and go back to the underlying lie that underpins the justification of this, this expenditure and waste of taxpayers' dollars that will have such a devastating impact on our economy and the climate, which is the greenhouse gas theory. Now, it's not a greenhouse gas law, it's a theory. It doesn't become a law until the mathematics proves the theory. Now, their, their theory is this, that an extra 100 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere will heat up the atmosphere by one degree. Right? So, technically speaking, it's 100, the, the CO2 uh, has increased by 140 parts per million in the last 100 years or so, uh, and they're arguing now that the temperature of the atmosphere has increased by 1.4 degrees. So it's effectively 100 parts per million has increased the atmosphere by uh, one degree. Now let's divide that by 100. So one part per million has increased uh, the temperature of the 10,000 10, surrounding molecules of nitrogen, N2 and O2, by one degree. Now, the first law of thermodynamics, which is actually the science of heat, says that energy is neither created or destroyed, it can only be transformed or transferred. What that means is, for example, and ironically enough I learnt this in maths too, not physics, but is the laws of, uh, of momentum. So temperature is ultimately a measure of mean molecular momentum. Right? So if a car that weighs one tonne is travelling at 100 kilometres an hour and it hits another stationary car that weighs one tonne, Assuming no heat loss, the most that stationary car can travel is at 100 kilometres an hour. It cannot, the car that hit, hit it, if it was only travelling at 100 kilometres, cannot convert that into 150 kilometres, right? That is the law of conservation, okay? Energy cannot be created, okay? It can only be transferred or transformed. So with that in mind, we apply that to the molecules in the atmosphere in order for one molecule to transfer heat to 10,000 other molecules and heat it by one degree each, the temperature of that molecule has to be 10,000 degrees. Now, I'll qualify that because CO2 has a specific density 1.53, uh, or in other words, is one and a half times heavier than N2 and O2, the combined weight of N2 and O2 in the atmosphere. I won't explain that. That's molecular weights. You can work that out yourselves. But long story short, so you need about 6,600 CO2 atoms to actually transfer uh, their, that energy to, uh, so, sorry, I'll take that back. That means that one CO2 molecule has to have a temperature of 6,600 degrees in order to transfer one degree of heat to 10,000 molecules, right? Now, here's the thing. The sun only has a temperature of 5,700 degrees Kelvin. So what the greenhouse gas theory proponents are saying is that the, the temperature of a carbon dioxide molecule actually has to be hotter than the sun. Now, that is ridiculous, right? I mean, you talk about Jesus feeding 5,000 people with a you know, couple of fish. This is like the Jesus molecule who can basically transfer heat to, to, to 10,000 CO2, can transfer heat to 10,000 molecules. That cannot happen. And that mathematical equation alone just destroys their argument just like that. But I won't finish there because I'll go to the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of a system must always increase. 
What does that mean? It means that heat rises, heat expands. Okay? The greenhouse gas theory has this idea that somehow heat gets trapped in the atmosphere. It's like a blanket in the atmosphere that traps heat. That's not true. It is true that CO2, carbon dioxide, does absorb radiation and photons, and I'll come back to that with the third thing I'm going on. But right now, there is nothing in the atmosphere, there is not a solid object in the atmosphere that traps convection. So yes, CO2 does uh, absorb and emit photons, but it does not trap convection. So a greenhouse gas, for example, will allow sunlight in, the air will heat up, it will rise, but it cannot rise outside the greenhouse. So eventually the heat gets trapped at the top of the greenhouse and overnight it cools, and then the hot air condenses back into liquid and it goes back into the plants. There is nothing that traps heat in the atmosphere other than gravity itself, which I'll talk about later. And we know that. The evidence of, of, of that is the fact that the height of the troposphere at the equators is 16 kilometres high. The height of the troposphere at the, uh, at the poles is only six kilometres high. Why is the height of the troposphere at the equator so much higher than the height of the troposphere at the poles? It's because it's hotter at the equator. Because heat does not get trapped, it rises. Now, if we go back to the first law, could you imagine a carbon dioxide molecule? We've seen what happens when steam runs out of the jug. When the jug boils, the steam comes pouring out of the jug because hot air goes from hot to cold. If you have a shower and you keep the shower uh, windows closed, the windows in the shower bathroom closed, the room steams up. You open up the windows and the heat runs out. Okay? It's like having a shower down at the beach or when you go camping, you don't trap the heat. It just disperses off into space. And you've got to remember outer space is a very, very big place. And it's actually negative two, uh, sorry, two degrees Kelvin or negative 270 degrees in outer space. It is constantly sucking heat out of the atmosphere. Okay, so this idea that somehow heat gets trapped uh, by CO2 is complete rubbish because CO2 is not a solid object. Okay, it cannot trap conduction. Now, we go on to the third part of uh, heat transfer. So tonight uh, I've spoken about conduction and convection, the first and second law of thermodynamics. I'll now speak about the third way in which heat is transferred, which is radiation. Now, I will quote none other or lesser figure than Albert Einstein himself, who said in his 1917 paper, page 14, that radiation is so insignificant that it drops out as compared to other forms of heat transfer. Okay, and what he means by that is radiation is next to nothing, right? So if I walk out one day and I, I, I feel a sunny day, I get a bit of heat on my face, I go, yeah, well, that's radiation. But radiation does not have the same force as a flood. Or, or, or as the wind. I mean, anyone see a, has seen a cyclone and the impact that, a, that the wind can do, uh, or the impact of conduction when we say have a car accident or you have some form of physical contact, which is conduction, right? But so that's Einstein proving that. But I'll, I'll go further into radiation because this is the argument they love to confuse people with. It is true, and I'll admit the greenhouse gas theory is based on a partial truth. It is true that CO2, carbon dioxide, does absorb radiation. But here's the thing. Like all molecules, okay, every molecule has a certain number of vibrational frequencies, right? and that's based on the number of atoms in that molecule. Right? So CO2, because it has three molecules, has four vibrational frequencies. Now, those frequencies are at 2.8 micron, which is incoming radiation, an asymmetrical mode at 4.3 microns, and then two uh, outgoing modes, so there's two um, degenerate modes at 14.8 microns. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that, yes, it is true that CO2 absorbs the photons that travel with these particular uh, frequencies. And the way, best way to imagine this is, those of you who have ever tried to learn to surf, in order to stand up and catch a wave, you've got to be paddling in the same direction as the wave, you've got to be travelling at the same speed in order to get on the wave. So that's how it works with radiation. Radiation is transparent or, or to most molecules unless it's travelling at exactly the same frequency. Now, we know that CO2 absorbs incoming radiation at 2.8 microns. Right? That we know because of Planck's law and that it also absorbs outgoing radiation at 14.8, let's just call it 15 microns. We know, as per Planck's law, one of the great scientists of all time, Max Planck, he came up with his theory and said that the energy of wavelength is, is, in, is inversely proportional to the width, the energy of, to the width of the wavelength. Right? So because the incoming radiation at 2.8 is much smaller than the outgoing radiation of 14.8 microns, 14.8 divided by 2.8 is about 5, 
the energy absorbed by CO2 on the way in is actually five times more powerful than the energy absorbed on the way out. Okay? And of course, what that means is, and we can see that again, if we look at the equator, the maximum temperature around Singapore, for example, is around 37 degrees. Interestingly enough, I did a post on this back on about the 16th of September 2022. It might have been the 15th of September 2022, where I pointed out the maximum temperature of Singapore was about 35.6 degrees. And suddenly, in the year of, within the year of posting that, the maximum temperature of Singapore, all-time record, is now 37 degrees. But if you look at maximum temperatures of cities around the equator, it'll be around that 35 to 37 degree mark. Now, you compare that to the inland temperatures, say, here in Australia of Royal Kenya and that, it's closer to 50 degrees. So we know that uh, cities that have high humidity, i.e. lots of water vapour in the air, actually have cooler maximum temperatures. But you don't just have to look at cities. You can look at coastal locations. We know that cities that are on the coast have cooler, tend to be milder, uh, have cooler maximums, and it, albeit I'll admit this, have higher minimums as well. So the, the, the water vapour and the greenhouse gases tend to modulate the temperature because they're constantly absorbing and emitting photons. But let's not forget the second law of thermodynamics. It is much harder for an atom up in the air in the cooler parts of the atmosphere to emit a photon downwards because it's warmer, because heat always travels north. So most of the atoms emitted by CO2, or, or the photons, sorry, emitted by CO2 will actually still rise. And let's not forget the first law of thermodynamics. If, if a CO2 molecule does absorb a photon and, and absorbs energy, it's not stationary. It's not going to sit in the same spot. If it heats up, gets more energy, it's going to heat up, it's actually going to rise in itself. So yet again, another thing that invalidates the greenhouse gas theory. But let's not stop there. I actually asked Larry Marshall, the former head of the CSIRO, if I could have the model that the CSIRO used to calculate net zero. Because being the accountant and you know, being anal retentive that I am, I wanted to drill down into the detail of how it is that we calculate net zero. Because I'm of the belief that actually we would net zero about four times over, thanks to the great work of Ian Plymer, a renowned geologist who understands how the earth genuinely works. So I already think we're being ripped off. But here was the reply from the head of the CSIRO. He goes, which model, Senator? I go, what do you mean, which model? And he goes, well, there's 40 different models. Ah, oh. and I said, well, if there's 40 different models, how can the science possibly be settled? And it's like, well, he said, well, it's different in the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere and all this, so, you know, the verbiage started. But here's the thing, if the science is settled, why are there 40 different models to calculate net zero? If the scientists, I thought if this was all settled, there'd be one model. But you see, this is the rub. If you go and look, and I did a post on this yesterday on Facebook, if you look at these crazy energy budgets that these people put out, they want you to believe that the downwelling radiation from greenhouse gases is 341 watts per square metre. Now, that, and that the same model proposes that the energy from solar radiation that hits the Earth's surface is only 161 metres per square. Now, are you seriously tell